Hello, this is Angelie, and you are listening to or watching the podcast, Why You Do What You Do. The podcast that talks about human development and psychology to try and help you figure out maybe a little bit more of why you do what you do. Um, and last time we were uh, talking about, um, you know, uh, directions and in intelligence testing. Um, and today we're going to start off on talking about vocabulary, grammar, and syntax. Um, the way you talk. Um, you might not think about it while you're doing it, you know, um, you might have a problem <laughs> that causes problems while you're doing it, um, but we all do it, uh, to one extent or another, you know, even sign language is speech, so we all do it. Um, as vocabulary grows during the school years, children use increasingly precise verbs to describe an action, hitting, slapping, striking, pounding so it's not just you know you hit it or touched it or whatever um they learn that a word like uh run can have more than one meaning like you know uh, you have a run in your stocking or the ink ran on the page or you're running over there excuse me um a word can have more than one meaning and they can tell from the context which meaning is intended uh, they learn not only to use many more words, but to select the right word for particular use. Um, and, you know, that's something they grow into. As You know, as um, toddlers, sometimes they use words for things, <laughs> and it's very basic and, um, you know, uh, not a lot of exactness in their speech um, that comes with age. Uh, simile and metaphor. Figures of speech in which a word or phrase that usually designates one thing is compared or applied to another become increasingly common. Although grammar is quite complex by age six, children during the early school years rarely use the passive voice, as in the sidewalk is being shoveled. Verb tenses that include the auxiliary have I have already shoveled the sidewalk. And conditional sentences. If Barbara were home, she would have helped shovel the sidewalk. Um, up to and possibly after age nine, children's understanding of rules of syntax, how words are organized into phrases and sentences. Um, and each language has their own. Um, and, you know, I, I like studying language and things. I can't speak a lot of them, but... You know, you can almost listen to the way a person speaks and identify that language. Like um, the uh, English up tilt on the end of a sentence or the Irish lilt to certain words and, you know, <coughs> Scottish brogue or, you know, the Latin languages, you know, uh, flow and punctuation on the end, you know. <laughs> so um, syntax is something we really don't even think about. Um, until we hear somebody, you know, who's not used to speaking our language and they're speaking it in their cadence, you know, the syntax is off, you know, and we that's when we notice syntax. Becomes more sophisticated. Sentence structure continues to become more elaborate. Older children use more subordinate clauses. The boy who delivers the newspapers rang the doorbell. And they now look at the semantic effect of a sentence as a whole, rather than focusing on word order as a signal of meaning. So the meaning um, becomes more important than the way they put it to you. Still, some constructions, such as clauses, begin with however and although, do not become common until early adolescence, um, because little kids, you know, don't think about those comparables. Uh, the major area of linguistic growth during the school years is in pragmatics, the practical use of language to communicate. This includes both conversational and narrative skills, um, because before that they just wanted to convey something or ask something, um, and now they're getting more interested in uh, creating, you know, uh, telling a story <coughs> rather than, you know, just a sentence that conveys what they're trying to get out to you. Good conversationalists probe by asking questions before introducing a topic 
with which the other person may not be familiar. They quickly recognize a breakdown in communication and do something to repair it. There are wide individual differences in such conversational skills. Some seven-year-olds are better conversationalists than some adults. Um, and some of them are also better at an, um, understanding when you're not interested in a topic of conversation. You know, um, there's not a whole lot worse than somebody who's droning on and on and on about something you don't care about. Um, and if I'm doing that for you, then you just find something else to watch. <laughs> somebody might want to know what I'm saying, you know. <laughs> That's why I'm bothered. You know, I ain't trying to teach you this because it's something to do. I got other things I could be doing, yeah. <laughs> School children are highly conscious of adults' power and authority. First graders respond to adults' questions with simpler, shorter answers than they gave their peers um, because um, they're a little bit afraid. They know they're little, this person is big, um, and um, especially... You know, there's an instinct there that uh, they could do something to me. And so I'm just going to be as concise as I can be. I'm not going to play with them like I play with the other kids. And that's a shame, you know, because you should be able to have some fun with your parents and your kids, you know. Eh. It, let's see. They issue more demands and engage in less extended conversations with their parents. Um, so they're wanting their parents just to kind of meet their needs, um, and they don't talk with them about stuff. They do that with their peers. Um, all parents hate that. It's a fact of life. Sorry. <laughs> they're going to talk to their peers more than they're going to talk to you about stuff. And that's a shame. <laughs> when children this age tell stories, they usually do not make them up. They are more likely to relate a personal experience. So remember that. All these people who say little kids make up lies and stories about people, you know, uh, doing stuff to them. That's not true. Kids this young don't have the knowledge of such things, unless unfortunately they do, um, to tell such stories. So if a child of six or seven tells you that something has happened, believe them because something has happened. Most six-year-olds can retell the plot of a short book, movie, or television show. They are beginning to describe motives and causal links. Um, they're starting to understand, you know, why did they do that? You know, what made them think that was something they should do? Or why didn't they do that? You know, they're starting to understand there's a reason, you know, for people's behavior. Um, so that's also something that's a milestone in your mental abilities. <clears throat> By second grade, children's stories become longer and more complex. Fictional tales often have conventional beginnings and endings, such as Once Upon a Time and They Lived Happily Ever After, or simply The End, because, you know, that's how it is in their storybooks. So when they're telling a story, that's how they do it. <laughs> Word use is the more varied than before, but characters do not show growth or change, and plots are not fully developed. Um, because you have an idea, there was this girl who did this and this, and, you know, uh, they aren't quite ready to write their novel yet, at, you know, first and second grade. <laughs> so, <coughs> they got a little bit to learn on that part. Older children usually set the stage, with introductory information about the setting and characters. And they clearly indicate changes of time and place during their story. They construct more complex episodes than younger children do, but with less unnecessary detail. They focus more on the characters' motives and thoughts, and they think through how to resolve problems with the plot. Now, see, when I was growing up in middle school, I, I wrote a book in middle school. We all had to in my middle school <laughs> that year. Um, but it made me realize I loved writing. Um, but we were taught, you know, you have to have the, the introduction, the cast of characters, uh, you know, your index and your outline and, you know, the preface and all that stuff. And, of course, nowadays, you don't have to have any of that. 
uh, some of the biggest writers don't have, you know, uh, the characters. They don't have an, a beginning outline. They just jump you right into the book. Um, and I like that better because, honestly, if you're telling me ahead of time, I'm, I'm not going to remember by the time we get to this character. Um, and if you're giving me the outline, you know, what's on it, I don't really care. <laughs> I want to get into the book. So, <laughs> those things nowadays have become unnecessary. You know, some sticklers for, you know, um, the right way, which they were taught back in the day. Um, think that's necessary. Nowadays, a lot of authors think that's unnecessary, you know, and I agree with that. <clears throat> Children can identify a printed word in two ways. One is called decoding. The child sounds out the word, translating it from print to speech before retrieving it from long-term memory. Um, so, yeah, all those spelling words, vocabulary words you had to do, there was a reason for that. It was so that it would get into your brain so that as an adult you could speak like an adult um, and convey meaning in a more concise, accurate way. <laughs> to do this, the child must master the phonetic code that matches the printed alphabet to spoken sounds. Yeah, so all that you know, phonics and spelling, it was to help you out. <laughs> no, you don't want to hear that, but sorry, it was. The second method is visually based retrieval. The child simply looks at the word and then retrieves it. And that's something that my children uh, had when they were in school. And uh, me and uh, one of the ECE teachers were just like, no, this is not helpful. They're not learning anything. They're not learning how to decode uh, and pronounce and things of that nature. So, you know, a couple of us were just not happy with the whole, you know, sight words thing. <clears throat> um, the traditional approach, which emphasizes decoding, is called the phonetic or code emphasis approach. The more recent whole language approach emphasizes visual retrieval and the use of contextual clues. Um, and see, back in, when I was coming up, you didn't give the kid clues. They had to learn it. So, <laughs> our kids got it a lot easier than we'd had it. Um, whole language programs are built around real literature and open-ended, student-initiated activities. In contrast with the more rigorous, teacher-directed tasks involved in phonics, instruction um and so they're trying to make it more engaging for the kids um but later i'm going to find out how that works out um the whole language approach is based on the belief that children can learn to read and write naturally much as they learn to understand and use speech to foster this natural process children are encouraged to experience from the beginning the purpose of written language to communicate meaning, and that's what it is, you know, um, you can't always call someone or write someone, uh, you know, uh, who's nearby, or I put write someone in there, that's what we're talking about anyway, anyway, but if you can write a letter, you can write a memo to everyone, like if you were in the office, you couldn't tell everyone, you know, if you worked in a, you know, 20 story building or whatever, but you could have an inner office memo and shoot that out in the email, so, you know, that's, Wow, that's a helpful thing. Whole language proponents uh, assert that children learn to read with better comprehension and more enjoyment if they see written language as a way to gain information and express ideas and feelings, not as a system of isolated sounds and syllables that must be learned by memorization and drill. Um, and some kids, you know, have an easier time with school than other kids. Some kids don't mind all that. Some kids do. Critics say that the whole language teaching encourages children to skim through a text, guessing at words and their meanings, and not to try and correct reading or spelling errors. Um, and that's kind of the problem that I and the other teacher had with that, is that they're 
letting them get away with being wrong <laughs> so that they can, you know, just express themselves, you know. Reading, they say, is a skill that must be taught. The brain is not programmed to acquire it. A long line of research supports the view that phonetic awareness and early phonics training are keys to reading proficiency. So there you guys who are up in the sight word things, bad news for you. The brain, you know, um, might see a word and recognize a word, but to understand and decode language, you need to learn to speak and understand that language. So the phonics does do that and has value, therefore. Many experts now recommend a blend of the best of both. The phonetic and the whole language approaches. Um, so you can do the little words, the sight words, and, you know, do that stuff. That's fine. Um, but you need to teach the children phonics so they can decode your language um, and be able to reproduce it. Children learn phonetic skills along with strategies to help them understand what they read. Such a combined approach seems best suited to the way children's brains work. So, you know, teachers can mean well, and teachers do take a little bit of psychology, but not full-on, you know, like a psychologist would. So, you know, it might behoove some of you teachers, if you hear this, um, to kind of throw some of them phonics back in. You know, now I've heard that they have in some schools, but not in all. So, you know, it's important to teach our children. Because academic skills such as reading are the product of many functions in different parts of the brain working together, instruction focused solely on specific sub-skills, phonetics or comprehension, is less likely to succeed than a program that covers a broad constellation of skills. Children who can choose either visually based or phonetic strategies using visual retrieval for familiar words and phonetic decoding as a backup for unfamiliar words, become better, more versatile readers. So there you go. Um, I'm not going to say that's why we have a generation <laughs> problem with a lot of these kids who can't read now that they're out in the workforce. Um, and, you know, you see them at places they're working and they can't read what's on a, you know, register and what's on this. <sighs> So, you know, I think that area of time when that was happening, we did a disservice to our children uh, because you need to be able to speak a language uh, and learn a language um, to read and write with the language. That's just a fact right there. Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the developmental processes that improve comprehension or understanding of written passages are the same as those that improve memory. As word identification becomes more automatic, and as the capacity of working memory increases, children can focus more on the meaning of what they read. New, more sophisticated strategies enable children to adjust their reading speed and attention to the importance and difficulty of the material. So see, um, if you have a poor reader, that might be a foreteller of the fact that they're going to have memory issues later on. You know, unfortunate, but now we're starting to see that this can be a thing. Metacognition, awareness of what is going on in one's own mind, helps children to monitor their understanding of what they read and to develop strategies, such as rereading difficult passages, reading more slowly, trying to visualize what is being described, and thinking of examples to clear up any problems. And I was, uh, as a kid, I would think up examples in my head. I would think about, you know, pictures of what this would mean and that. Um, and a lot of kids, you know, develop strategies for things like that. Um, so, you know, you have to know what's going on in your own mind. And unfortunately, there are adults who still, you know, have problems with that. You know, what were you thinking about? I have no idea. I was just, you know, <laughs> okay. 
As children's store of knowledge increases, they can more reliably check new information against what they already know. Some teaching methods help children develop interpretive strategies through in oh gosh, literary discussion. Excuse me. Mm. Teachers can model effective strategies such as making associations with prior knowledge, summarizing, visualizing relationships, and making predictions. So <coughs> if a kid's not, you know, <coughs> great, teachers can help out. They can, you know, buddy and say, why don't we try why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? Um, and that's what good teachers do. Good teachers want your child to succeed. Good teachers aren't caring about, oh, you don't do crap. I'm going to fail you. That's not a good teacher. The good teacher should be trying to help your child succeed. The acquisition of writing skills goes hand in hand with the development of reading. As children learn to translate the written word into speech, they also learn that they can use written words to express ideas, thoughts, and feelings. Older preschoolers begin using letters, numbers, and letter-like shapes as symbols to represent words or parts of words, syllables, or phonemes. Often their spelling is quite inventive, so much so that they may not be able to read it themselves. <laughs> now, you know, you have a kid and you say, well, what does that say? I don't know. <laughs> they don't remember. It looked good at the time. They don't remember. <laughs> you know. I've seen some interesting things on some schoolwork. <laughs> Writing is difficult for young children, and early compositions usually are quite short. Often school writing assignments involve unfamiliar topics. Children must draw together and organize diverse information from long-term memory and other sources. Unlike conversation, which offers constant feedback, writing requires the child to judge independently whether the goal has been met. Um, so a lot of kids just don't like writing. They just don't. Um, and uh, they'll just write it as short as they can. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I knew kids like that. I'd have this two-page story. These people have like three lines. <laughs> you know. <coughs> and everybody's different. The child also must keep in mind a variety of other constraints, spelling, punctuation, grammar, and capitalization, as well as the basic physical task of forming letters. Children who type or use word processors write better, since they do not have to deal with the mechanical demands of handwriting. Um, and I had uh, students who did that. They had their little, you know, word processor. Um, and they would do it on that because it, uh, they had, you know, disabilities where the language was uh, a problem and they could take all day to write. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, on their IEPs, it usually says extra time, you know, uh, and if you're in the school business, you better give them kids that extra time <laughs> because uh, there are parents who uh, will not let you slide on that. I'm one of them. <laughs> Even today, when many children go to preschool and most go to kindergarten, children often approach the start of first grade with a mixture of eagerness and anxiety. <coughs> now, I was eager. <coughs> I know kids who were scared and anxious and didn't want to do it. Um, but that, you know, all of us react differently to things. So, The first day of regular school is a milestone. A sign of the development advances that make this new status possible. Because you're a big kid now, you know. <coughs> you're going to big kid school. <laughs> Personally, like I said, I was ready. But I, I've known a lot of people who were not. And I have one of my children who I feel like should have been held back a year before they started. Because we talked about it with the kindergarten teacher. Because of his age, the way his birthday fell, they said he, they needed, he needed to go. Then once we got him in the classroom... He said, well, we probably should have held him back a year, you know. But once that's done, nothing you can do about it. So, A child's first grade performance can affect the entire school career. Just as the curriculum in each grade builds on what went before, 
so does the file that follows the child from year to year. This paper trail helps shape each new teacher's perceptions and expectations, expectations that can affect achievement in the middle grades and even high school. So, you know, they, they're calling it here a paper trail. <coughs> I know principals and counselors are like, your permanent record, you know. And it's like, well, it's not really your permanent record. It's till you graduate <laughs> permanent record. Um, but it does, you know, show other teachers what other teachers thought about you, you know. Um, and I had a teacher who in... Um, First grade didn't like me so much. <laughs> I think it's more that she didn't like my mom, but that was taken out on me. So um, there's a lot in my permanent record because um, uh, I got copies of all my, um, you know, report cards and things like that. Um, and, you know, there were things about how um, she daydreams a lot. She does, She speaks out too much, you know, things like that. But yet you look at the grades and the grades are all, you know, honor roll grades, but she just clearly had a problem with my personality. But like I said, I think it's more she had a problem with my mom because my mom had to go talk to her about a project we were doing. So, you know, but stuff like that happens. The amount of kindergarten a child has had, um, children who had attended full day kindergarten did better on achievement tests and got higher marks in reading and math early in first grade than those who had attended kindergarten half day or not at all. So kindergarten, yes. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, they have different programs, different schools, they call them different things. But yes. Children in two parent families tended to do better than children in single parent families, apparently because of economic disparities. Um, and I know that was a thing uh, when I was divorced. Um, because he made more money than me. So even though I was trying to do equal with him, um, I didn't have as much money. So I couldn't give them the big expensive things he could. I couldn't take them on the big trips he could. And finally, we had to reach compromise, um, to where we would both do, you know, things together. Um, and the things that I usually used to do with them on the weekends, since he got them every weekend, and we won't even get into that one, uh, as a judge's decision. But, uh, <laughs> Um, I would do things through the week that I used to do with them on the weekend. So there's a way to even things out when there are disparities, you know, between income, uh, between mom and dad who are divorced, um, you know. Um, and that's where I'm going to leave you today. So I hope that helped you figure out maybe a little bit more of why you do what you do. Until next time.